What's up, everybody? Welcome to For the Record. I'm your host, Rob Markman. I know what we're here for. I know what we're here to discuss. Drake is back. His sixth studio album, Certified Lover Boy. Listen, they say it's his sixth, but I mean, do you count more life? Do you count if you're reading this? It's too late. One was a playlist, one was a mixtape. I don't know, but it's a new Drake project, and you know we got to discuss it. And I have some of my dopest friends, my most knowledgeable friends, who I wanted to bring on this show to discuss it, okay? First up, we have a newcomer to the show, but we've been friends for a really long time. We're talking about Drake, so I had to get somebody from the North. I had to get somebody from Toronto. She is a former music journalist, but I feel like you still got some writing in you. Currently, she's over there managing artist partnerships at TikTok. Erin Lowers, welcome to the show. What's up, y'all? I'm so stoked to be reporting live and direct from Toronto today to do this. Yes, yes, yes. No, we're going to need that perspective because a lot of times with with a lot of Drake albums, there'll be kind of references that just the town would get, just y'all would get, and then we would catch it on later. So I would love for you to help us decode some of that stuff. And next, she's family here. We absolutely love her. She is the new host of Amazon Music's Rap Rotation Radio Station. She's also the co-host of the Brown Bag Podcast. She's a regular here. Her takes, always welcome. Letty. Welcome to For the Record. What's up, Drake Hive? Don't get mad at me for what I'm about to say. <laughs> Jesus, coming what out happened? already. <laughs> Let, let's, let's do it. Let's get into it. So last week, you know, we knew that Drake was coming. September 3rd was the date. We started to see billboards pop up all over the world, teasing the different features, expecting the album. There was one in NYC that said, hey, New York, the GOAT is on CLB. Some people speculated that that was Jay. I knew it because who else would it be? The GOAT is one person. Um, <laughs> other billboards popped up in Atlanta, Nigeria, California, Houston, more. What did y'all think about the rollout for the album? Erin, I'll start with you. Um, just seeing how this thing was unfurling, what, what were you feeling? Yo, I think every time that Drake does a release, it's just like the billboards start popping up in the city and you know what's good. You know what's coming. You know what's exciting. I think like even the night before they did a drive throughout the city, they were throwing out t-shirts. Like there's such an anticipation and excitement in the city for these things. And now you start incorporating other cities and you're seeing like, you know, so-and-so is on the album. So-and-so here is on the album. And you're just like, okay, now he's connecting it to other people in other regions. It's a blessing to see that come through every time. Yeah, that's real. Letty, what about you? When you started seeing the billboards pop up, first of all, I know, I know you're a big Kid Cudi fan. I don't know that there was a... Did we see a Cleveland billboard? Did Cuddy not get a billboard yes. or did I miss that? Yeah, he said Cutter is on the album. Okay. That one was a shock because of the history with them, because of Cuddy's friendship, alliance, frenemyship with Kanye. Um, but I will say, like, I think that it was such a genius move because for the most part within hip hop, the most prideful people are going to be the people from your hometown, right? But Drake used this tactic to be able to let all of these cities feel like this is also their album. So he was able to be like, look, this person from your side is on my album and let it feel like it's yours too. And I thought that was genius. I thought that was amazing. I liked that more than the quote billboards. To me, without context of the album or how he's rapping it, they can lean more towards corny. And so I feel like he killed it with the like shouting out the people that are on the album. And I think other artists are going to take that into consideration within their rollouts. Oh, you know, you know, Drake is a trendsetter. So you're going to see a lot more of that. See, I disagree, though. I, I like maybe because I'm just the lyric guy, but I like the lyric um, billboards because I was like, oh, these are IG captions. Like we always say that about Drake. Like when Drake drops an album, we have IG captions for the rest of the year. And I was like, oh, this is what he's setting us up for. So I wasn't mad at the lyric ones. Like, I, I was like, oh, we're going to see these on IG in a minute, you know? I like and lyrics when stuff. they're, like, dope. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we're going to get into it. I know. I think for us, though, because there wasn't, like, you couldn't say Drake is on the album in Toronto, right? Like, <laughs> it's that. Drake's album. So, you know, we had the lyric billboards. And it, it was fun. It's fun for us to see that. Um, you know, something's got to give. And other than me, I think that was one of the quotes. And it's just like... Yo, you feel that something's got to give, and it's, it can't be him. Uh, so I guess it was a different experience on this set. Yeah, now nah, I, I, I feel you. Um, okay, so the album dropped and dropped a little later than usual. Usual on the East Coast, where where 
used to a, a midnight release. I think it came a little closer to 2 p.m., 2 a.m., might have been 1.30-ish or something like that. But um, let's talk about expectations and first impressions. Um, let the if I'll start with you, because I want to get into Aaron. Basically, I, I kind of feel like I know where you're going to go. So what were your expectations and what were your first impressions? Well, you know, I feel like Drake's even summary of it, like this is toxic masculinity, basically at its best. And then going into just someone self-realizing maybe I'm the problem. I kind of expected something along those lines. What I heard was, yeah, those like glimpses of like, I know I'm the one doing it in the wrong, but I don't know necessarily if we got like a full on accountable person at the end of the album, but Drake's still growing. So why would we, right? Um, I would have... I think that Drake is forever chasing his quote unquote classic album because no one gave him that with his first like actual official releases. I know we gave that to his mixtapes and I think a more threaded album would have been cooler for me than like a compilation of songs. But it is what it is. He's a certified lover boy and that's what he gave us. Okay. So your impression, you you felt like what we have was more like a compilation of strong, like nothing like completely th- threaded in the narrative. Yeah, I, I feel like I didn't really get the thread because there's so many threads to um, to Drake. I feel like no matter what the album was, everyone was looking for the thread of like the Kanye stuff. And I feel like I I found myself searching more for that and then finding like the, the whole thread of Kid Cudi being in there and Jay-Z being on there over Drake having this self-realization on an album. Mm-hmm. No, that, that, that's interesting. We'll, we'll get back to the, to the classics, too. Um, I always say I, I think he has three. If I count So Far Gone, I also count Take Care, and to me, Nothing Was the Same was a classic. I know, I know a lot of people consider, um, if you're reading this, a classic. Um, you know, so it, it's so funny with the conversation, and I wonder how much that drives him you know, even on Scorpion, he said, oh, this is one of the classic. That's just 10 of these. Like, he's acknowledged kind of the, the thirst or, or the criticism that he doesn't have a classic. But I feel like depending on who you ask, you're going to get a different answer. So it's, it's interesting where everybody lies in that. Um, Aaron, expectations and first impressions. You know, my expectations were like, he's coming off of this, uh, this title of Artist of the Decade. You know what I mean? I think for me, it was going to be, before I thought about it, it was going to be an album that celebrates that, that celebrates those 10 plus years in the game, you know, and the formula that he's created that is continually successful. So it did meet, you know, expectations. It did meet exactly what I thought it would be um, with respects to even, you know, the nods, the chips on his shoulders that he still has. Uh, he has a line about, you know, not winning awards and that's still a thing, right? So I think it's really just that celebration moment that like, almost victory lap for those 10 years. Um, and it really stood, it stood what it had to do. Like it stood up for what it had to do. You know, that's interesting. I, I often think about that, Drake, because he does have the chip on his shoulder. And I think it gives him a competitive advantage when he raps from that perspective. But there's a part of me that's like, dude, but you're Drake. Like, like you are a generational talent, a leader of this generation, a trendsetter. You're the guy that everybody wants to be in a lot of ways. You know, even like on Laugh Now, which didn't make the album, but even that line where he's like, and I've never been embraced. And I'm like, and, and I wonder if he actually feels like that. I'm like, bro, you might be the most embraced. I mean, I, I would say like as a Canadian artist, every time he drops something, even with this album, somebody's like, oh, he's from Canada. What does he know about X, Y, Z? Why does he talk like that? Like, I think it really is this like this mentality that we've kind of grown to have in Canada too. Like we're not the quote unquote best until, you know, you're at the top, 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 where people stop questioning whether or not you're, um, you know, the worth having around. So. Listen, uh, uh, no, and, and I feel that. And I, and I know from a, from a rap perspective, too, like, you got to keep that edge on you. You know, I think it just keeps you sharp as well. So I always wonder how much of that is, is him just trying to stay sharp and how much of that is how much he really feels. And maybe the answer is like somewhere in the middle. But I'm here to tell Canada now, Toronto, if y'all ever had any doubt, no one is sleeping on y'all. Y'all got the biggest artists in the world. Y'all got Drake. Y'all got Abel. Like, there's the things producers. happening up there. Yeah, the producers are amazing. Um, and 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 we're definitely vibing to it. But but I get I, I get that too. Like I understand. It's easy for me to say because I come from New York, which I think traditionally has always got credit in hip hop. Um, 
even though I think we're getting shitted on now. But anyway, that, that that's a whole other episode. Um, let's get right into it. Okay, what were the standouts? Um, right away, we got a music video. The first music video out the gate was Way Too Sexy um, with Future and Thug, and it samples Right Said Fred's 1991 song, I'm Too Sexy. I have thoughts on it. Um, Aaron, I'll start with you. Too sexy. Is way too sexy your jam? Like, like when you first heard it, what was your impression of that song? Listen, if we're talking about, you know, the most unexpected and almost least favorite songs on the album, that would be up there off jump. But then it grew on me. It grew on me over the past four days. And I'm not sure what to do with this information. Um, you know, I remember <laughs> Right Said Fred as a song my brother and I used to sing to each other as a kid. And now we're here. And now I'm listening to it again. So... I, it's grown on me in, in a very strange but exciting way, I guess. Listen, I, I know you're, you're managing the artist partnerships over there at TikTok. Um, I know the world is waiting for Drake to join TikTok. Aubrey, if ever there was a perfect time to get on the TikTok platform, I think Way Too Sexy is an amazing entry point. The ball's in your court, brother. This is it. Let's go. <laughs> That's real. Lefty, way too sexy. What, what, what do you think? You know, to me, I just, one of the things that I enjoy about Drake is his sense of humor and his ability to be the suave, like, lover boy, but also, like, put, like, inject that. Like, we saw, we've seen that in videos, like, the 0 to 100 video, where, like, they definitely try to, like, incorporate little funny skits and stuff. And I think that this was his try at, like, you're probably going to clown this album, like, detractors of Drake right uh, trying to call him a certified lover boy or clowning on that fact so he's trying to get ahead of that why don't I just do it before you do it um and I think he could like literally it's really cool when an artist doesn't take themselves that seriously yeah and, and I think you forget his sense of humor even you know he used to do the skits with, with his cousins and with Obi O'Brien and like you know started from the bottom video uh, we got a lot of kind of funny funny moments from Drake I'm not going to lie. When I first heard Way Too Sexy, like the sample, a shout out to TM88. TM88, who produced this record, is, is my guy. Dude is incredibly talented. But when I first heard the sample, I didn't even read the credits. I just said, nah, I can't do it. And, and maybe it's because- You've been singing it all through before we started recording. <laughs> the secrets are coming out. Sounds like your jam. Listen, we're, we're not supposed to talk about what goes on off camera. But I was triggered. Like It, it was just like an annoying song. To me, when it first came out, right, said Fred, and, and it was never like a song that I, I took seriously as a kid. So once I heard that sample, I said, "No fucking way!" Like, yo, he actually went here, and I, I and I decided that that song wasn't for me. Wake up the next morning, see the video, laugh my ass off, like the Kawhi part. Like, video is hilarious. They did what they had to do. I said, okay, the video is funny and entertaining. I'm still not fucking with this. This song is not for me. I go to the gym the next morning. I see all the women in the stepping class stepping to the song. And you go on social media and everybody is vibing to the song. And now it's like, holy shit, I won't be able to escape this song. So do I just give in? Like, should, should I just give it up? Should I just give in and, and, and get my way too sexy on? Morning mantras, man. Morning mantras. You got to just say it in the morning. Um, you be all right. It's going to grow on you. It's like your affirmations for sure. <laughs> I can't. I, I, Guys I, I need might... it too. I might draw the line at that one, but he, um, I feel like Poppy's home too he is like tongue in cheek. Like I, I feel like he was having a lot of fun on that, and now you see Nikki comes through at the end. I thought that was another fun song. What, what, what were some of the other standouts to y'all that that y'all liked on this album, or stuff that just standed out maybe for the wrong reason? Because I'm such a big Kid Cudi fan, is I Am Y Two, and I think it's such a good like moment for them to have together in whatever type of midst the beef is because years from now we're going to forget about like the situation surrounding the album and we're just going to have the body of work right and I feel like this body of work with that song gives you a mesh of Cuddy's world and Drake's world it was a perfect like neither kind of fell into the other's vibe too much and sometimes you get that with collabs one gets overshadowed by the other artists I guess feel and I honestly don't remember too many Kid Cudi songs where he's able to like sing about love or a girl. He doesn't have too many if they're not jokey, right? And Drake allows him to do that. And then Cudi allows Drake to fall into like just this amazing universe of like 
Kid Cudi. That is these different sounds, these different hums, these different melodies. And I just think it's beautiful. Also a collab that's a long time coming. People don't know that Drake was supposed to or wanted to be on Day and Night by Kid Cudi. And so that was like way back in the day. And since then they, had, they haven't collabed. And so to see that come together and for them to be in each other's good graces. Oh, I love it. That's my fave. Right. Because it got dark there for a second. Two birds, one stone. Like... Like it got dark between them, and, and I just remember those guys coming up doing like the GQ shoot together, um, and and uh, you know I think Wale was a part of that as well. Um, so just to kind of see that class of MC really kind of grow over ten years later, over a decade later, and these guys are, are the torchbearers, you know, for this generation to see them come together was dope. What about you, Aaron? And anything stood out to you for for, for the right or the wrong reasons? What were your favorite tracks? I love a strong opener. I think Champagne's poetry was like easily one of my favorite and I keep going back to it. And it's not just because it's a strong opener, but because there's so much, uh, you know, there's a Toronto feel to it, whether it's the mood, whether it's the flip of the mood, whether it's the production on it, like there's just this, this very strange feeling to it that makes you know that it's a Toronto album and a Toronto song. There's also lyrics on the end that kind of, you know, he takes accountability for for almost tying himself into to some street polys in a very, you know, unaware way. Um, but he mentions it. He mentions, you know, the city politics about it and how people always expect him to do more. Um, so I think just for me on that end, it's like listening to it in Toronto, knowing what's going on, that holds a, a pretty heavy weight. Um, but I will say a track with Rick Ross never misses between Drake and him. And, you know, I'm always looking forward to those ones, too. Yeah, Aaron, it's funny that you you, you mentioned um, You Only Live Twice, which I call YOLO Part 2. Or, or, you know, it's like the motto, too. You know, my expectations for this album, I was really expecting something just like classic and amazing from Drake. And if I'm going to be honest... I might have to change my expectations. I, I think Drake does everything like so well. Like he raps like really well, as well as damn near anybody who raps. He um, creates pop songs damn near as well, if not better than anybody who's creating pop records. Like the melodies, the culture stuff. Like he does everything so well. And I think each fan kind of wants Drake to be their own thing, right? Like like for me, my. Ideal Drake album is like him rapping for, for like 10 records, like a Griselda type album where he's just going off on his Drake shit. And with this album, we didn't get that. And, I, you know, because I don't think he wants to give it. So why should, you know, he, he kind of has to create what makes sense for him and what fulfills him. And so I think he gives a little bit of everything to each type of fan, right? And with this record, it was funny because we talk about YOLO too. I feel like, this album gave us different versions of songs that we might have had already. Like, you know, 70, 7 a.m. on Bridal Path is, is another timestamp joint. Um, the Remorse kind of reminds me, and maybe this is just the way my brain is working, but reminds me of The Calm, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and he starts revisiting kind of familiar themes. No new friends in the industry reminds me of no new friends. You know, like, like it, you know, we've kind of heard... Um, Drake give us this before, so so it's really really interesting. Um, I want to talk about seven a.m. because you know timestamp Drake is, is a special Drake. I think especially for the rap fans, people who are fans of bars, and and you know this is where he really just kind of goes off, and in a lot of ways gives us updates on his life. Um, and then sometimes like dishes out the smoke. Like if you remember four p.m. in Calabasas, like Puff got them shots <laughs> on that record. Seven a.m. on Bridal Path. Kanye West, um, you know, give that address to your driver, make it your destination instead of just a post out of desperation. Um, what was your reaction to, to, to hearing this? You know, I, I feel like I was waiting for this song. Um, you know, again, the timestamp songs, you know, it's going to be a, a moment. You know, it's going to be Drake bar for bar. Um, so I kind of expected this to come through. And I think he did it very, very well, very well. There was some, you know, you can dissect the entire song and you can hear it out and see what's being said. Um, so I, I love it. Uh, you know, it is what it is. I'm excited to see what happens with it going forward. The competition's there. 
What's up? Let me ask you a question too, because I want to know what's up. It's so funny. I feel like Drake and Kanye are having like a GPS battle. Um, you know, if you, even if you go back to sicko mode, he's like, you know, make a left, <laughs> make a right, <laughs> it's on site. Like Kanye posting his address. I, I heard people say that it wasn't such a big deal. First of all, I think that's kind of disrespectful. Like I, I wouldn't post anybody's address. But people were like, if, well, if you're in Toronto, everybody knows where Drake lives. Like you still just can't get there. You know what I mean? I mean, he lives on a road. Bridal path is a road. Um, Prince used to live there. So, you know, it's a, it used to be called Millionaire's Row. It's probably Multi-Millionaire's Row at this point. And, like, it's not a secret as to where he lives. There's security. There's hella people you have to go through to get there. But his address has been out. You can drive by whenever you want. Um, so it's not the big deal that I think everybody thought it was with that GPS drop. I, I, yeah, I still think that's kind of weird, though. Like, I, I'm used to my rappers really... Listen, man, when we talk about Drake beef, classic Drake beef, like, back-to-back with Meek Mill... Like crazy records come out of that, dope lines come out of that. Um, you know, even his 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 beef with Pusha, it was just like I think we got dope music, and y- you know, I'm kind of good on the posting addresses on Instagram. Like I was just like, man, let, like rap or leave it alone. Um, let the you know, look another line. Look at these heroes falling from their grace and their older ages. If we talking top three, then you slide in the third like stolen bases. Um, what did you make of seven a.m. and this whole Kanye West Drake? back and forth. I'm curious to see if 7 a.m. existed before these past couple months, right? And if so, it just shows me more of what a chess player Drake is. He knows he needs more, like, motivation. He can't come out of, like, a basically cold war between Kanye and just start rapping about Kanye on this album. There needs to have had been, like, a predecessor moment. And so this... I think the the taking the jabs on him at Trippy Red's on Trippy Red's Red song gave the reaction from Kanye that Drake needed to supply this type of a song. And I think Drake again, he's playing chess. He knows that he has the moves to make and Kanye is very reactive to Drake. Kanye does not know how to not talk after Drake says something. He doesn't know how to like compose himself and Drake just knows that. He knows the triggers and just eats it up and then puts him on a song however that top three line I don't I I'm still thinking about that because the top three that I think and I feel like that we all think is not with Kanye when you say top three and rap yeah yeah so that leads me thinking some other stuff right and so it's like I don't know I don't know what he means there yeah. And I don't well, think he, that my t- any one in my top three has like slid. You know, but he is talking about look at our heroes falling from graces in their older ages. So definitely talking about the old guard. And then, it, but it is interesting to see if he's talking about this current top three that we often, for better or worse, pit against each other, which is Drake, Cole, and Kendrick. Um, you know, but but I, you know, I love that that he still has that competitive fire to want to have that type of spot. You know. Especially, we just came off of Kendrick off of the Keem joint, smoking on your top five. Like, who are they talking about? I, I think when you're at this level with these guys, it doesn't matter who the top three is. It doesn't matter who the top five is. I'm number one it, it, is kind of what they're feeling. But it'll be interesting to see what he was getting at. Um, I think 7 a.m. is immediate. I think all. I think that's the beauty of all of the timestamp joints that he gives us, that it really marks a moment in time. Like, he couldn't have written it that long ago because he references the Kanye West post. So, but uh, you make an excellent point. Like, I I think with the Trippy Red verse, he kind of set it up in the right way for Kanye to do something. And I think Drake, you know, Kanye is very like, or comes off as very kind of controlling and and, and very much mastermind. And yeah, I, I think Drake, a lot of this is showing him like, yo, you don't have as much control as you think, because even on the life of the party joint, which Drake leaked, when Con- when I call you, you just better be like, yo, I'm writing your joint or whatever the exact lyric was. But a lot of people were upset or felt like it was foul that Drake leaked that joint. I didn't think so. I was like, all's fair in love and war. Like, and, and if you have this diss track, then let me drop it before you drop it on me. I'm just going to premiere it on my radio show. I, you know... Sucks for Andre 3000 because I think Andre 3000 is, is rapping very open and honestly and earnestly and that he gets caught up in the middle of this. But if we're talking about a back and forth war, like this is n- nothing out of bounds. I, I, I think it's a 
brilliant move for Drake to release this Life of the Party joint. What did you guys think? Again, there's competition here, right? There's competition, and and I think it was all fair. Um, and it really does suck that Andre was caught in the middle. Like, I think that just that's not going to be the fun part. And I want to see those two actually, I want to see Drake and, and Dre actually collaborate the way that Dre wants him to, but uh, casualty of war, I guess. I just feel like you can't say all is fair in love and war and then have stipulations when it's on your end that gets hit. For example, the, the 40 line yeah. from Push. Right. Like we can't say all is fair in love and war, but then when it's not in your favor, then rules get thrown up and certain people can't be touched. Uh, it's just as grimy as the address thing. And I think Drake had to go there. He wanted to one up Kanye in their like too muchness, right? And I, I don't think that anyone is going to outdo Drake in the petty area because he's just that good. He, the pretty again, boys he knows, versus the petty boys. Yeah, he knows your <laughs> triggers and and then honestly you say that but like sometimes the pity boys the the petty boys and the pretty boys are one in the same. You know, it's like kettle talking and, to pots here. Facts. And, some, and sometimes they also the pity boys at the same time. <laughs> nah, but but no, but it's true. It, it, look, I I think Drake definitely was crying foul on the 40 line and and you know, I think it's a matter of taste. Of, of of what you will and won't do. Pusha was clear on what was in and out of bounds with him. Also, to be fair, Pusha's wife was referenced, you know. Um, but I think eventually Drake just took it on the chin because he was also kind of like, all right, look, if if if, if th- this is what you want to do, I lost. I'll take the L. I'll, I'll move on. Um, you know, I think he said that. And he admitted the L on the Rap Radar podcast. I think he, he was just like, yo, if this is what it is, all right, y'all got it. Like, if this is how y'all going to play, y'all got it. Um, so, you know, look, I think out of all the foul things that have been done, I, I think leaking a song isn't as foul. You know, I, I also question Kanye on some, if you have that three stacks verse, like, how are you even thinking about making this into a into a battle record? We lose sight of what the actual album was supposed to be about because of everything that surrounded it. Yeah. And, and I don't and, think it's just leaking the song. Sorry to cut you off, Rob. Yeah. I think it's what that does to Kanye. It's not, oh my God, he leaked my song. It's who gave him that song? Where did he get that? Like who in my circle is do is playing double agent? Already seeing his friends on like the album, like on C on CLB, like a cuddy or like Hove, like that's already having him like spiral. So now it's like, where did he get this song from? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and, you know, if you look at um, Consequence made a post about that, like, look, we're going to find out where this leak is coming from. And then he dropped the diss track, which I think my my whole thing about this, though, I I think they should just move on from this beef. Like, if if I'm being honest, because if we're talking about hip hop beef and back and forth, I don't think it's bringing out the best records in any of them on any side at, at this point. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, just let it go. Like, y'all don't like each other. I think we've seen the high point of this Kanye, Drake back and forth. I don't know where it goes from here, where it's like entertaining or or is inspiring anybody to make the best music. I'm assuming, even though Kanye is claiming GD now, and, and that's kind of crazy, but I'm assuming that it's not going to spill out to any street shit. It absolutely shouldn't. So if it's not going to go there, it's like, just let it go. And move on because we're not getting the best music. Like we were essentially robbed of an amazing Andre three thousand verse, you know. Um, so just let let it, if it's not inspiring you to make the best music, let it go. Because Kanye shouldn't have even spit those bars. I'm not mad that Kanye gave Drake those bars. It was just like that song wasn't the song maybe to do it on. I just think they're not good for each other. This really sounds like a toxic relationship that just needs everybody. Just needs to move on and just I think Drake even said like you know I keep trying to like mend it and then here you are just again trying to like ruin things again I really feel like they clearly have some love some bond that holds them together but when they're together they just do not mix and sometimes when that happens you gotta just do your best to stay away from the other well, yeah. person what it was Drake has always been open and honest about him inspiring to be Kanye level and and even Kanye inspiring Drake to take it past to where Kanye took it. So I think there was a competitive thing, but an admiration there. And then, you know, maybe Kanye being the older guard, having to contend with that 
he might not be the hottest right now. He might not be the guy that everybody's looking for and not wanting to relinquish that and let that go. So there's some tension there. Like, you you know, yeah. again, that line, and I'm sorry I don't have that line in front of me, but on Life of the Party, it's like, you know, e- even the way he speaks about Saha in that record makes me question that, you know, he was like, oh, well, Saha said that Sickle Mode was his biggest record. And then, okay, but Donda is my best ghostwriter. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of pushing sets. Uh, uh, seems like pushing Saha to the side when Saha has been an amazing collaborator with Kanye. Or, you know, when I call you, the only thing I want you to say is, oh, I'm writing your rap, sir, or, or some shit like that. Like, there's definitely like ego involved. That's the difference in, I think, the Drake beefs versus the Kanye beefs. Drake beefs with his peers. Kanye beefs with his friends. And that's what's crazy. It's like there has to be something within those interpersonal relationships that definitely needs work. Um, And I just think that, again, they're just not suited for each other as homies, as counterparts, as anything. People just need to chill. Yeah. Rahel, shout out to Rahel, super producer Rahel, just texted me the lyric. The Kanye lyric, this house of pain won't ever last. Saha told me to my face that Sickle Mode was his biggest song. Well, go on, because Donda was the best ghostwriter I ever had. Like, you know, oof. You know what I'm saying? But but you're right. You know, he, he gave, also at the tour, at the Life of Pablo tour, went at Jay, you know, gave Jay some work on stage. Like, yeah, Kanye, there, there seems to be, he lashes out a lot at the people around him. Right. I will say, though, if it gives us more 7 a.m.s on Bridal Path, I am still here for it. <laughs> also not... Good for their mental health, girl. <laughs> Again, though, but, but it goes back. And if I'm being honest about this album, like, I had to lower my expectations because maybe my expectations were too high. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is a Drake album. Like, this is the album that Drake wants to deliver. As dope as 7 a.m. is, not my favorite timestamp joint. You know, you know, so... um. Also, let's talk, I don't want to spend all the time talking about beef, but I'd be remiss. Kanye isn't the only one who gets shot. Swizz caught some heat that I think a lot of people didn't see coming, but on You Only Live Twice, yeah, I never did nothing. You want to play like we family, huh? Next thing you want to shoot me down, it can't be love. Not sure where you was trying to send it, it can't be up. That day you sounded like a bitch, you fancy, huh? Oof. <laughs> that was heavy. That, that's a heavy... <laughs> That was a you lot. You gotta take that on the chin sometimes, though, because when it's that good, what can Swizz respond with? And and Swizz was wrong. Look, to Swizz's credit, I don't kind of know what's going on between them, but he apologized after, you know, that that's when, for, for those watching and may not have the reference, when he was on IG Live with Busta, there was a song with Busta and Drake that leaked over a Dilla beat. Busta talked about not being able to actually release the song or clear it. But Busta also wasn't upset by it because that wasn't the intention of the collaboration originally. And of course, hip hop would love to hear Drake over a Dilla beat, would love to hear Drake with Busta. And I think Swizz was a little upset by that and, and expressed his upsetness, his disappointment, and said um, he's going to shoot Drake's plane out the sky. And I think he called him a pussy boy. And it, it was a lot of like out of character shit for Swizz. Um, and he did apologize the next day. But, you know, at the same time, like, you know, when Drake knows how to seize a moment. So Drake still quiet. And when it's time to release the album, you're going to know what I think about you now. Um, you know, I think Swiss kind of fucked up. Like, <laughs> I mean, he was waiting for the right moment. You know, it's, it was calculated. It was it was blessed. It was those are happy bars. You can't refute them. Um, it's just good raps. Like, I, I, I don't expect these guys. I I'm. I, I, but also, I want it to be done. Like, I don't, I don't want to Drake Swizz back and forth. I want them, when they see each other, to hug it out and be like, fuck it. You know, because Drake still be, like, in the, in the Versus comments. Like, like, how do you not love Versus? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's a cultural moment. Uh, agree to disagree. You got me. I got you back. Except mine's is on the album that is streaming record numbers, so it's going to last a lot longer. He makes his responses last. He, he he knows when and how to respond. In such an age of social media, we're so quick to tweet our response. That goes away. That never gets played anywhere besides that week when we talk about it. Drake is like, oh, no, you're going to hear my response forever. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as you press play, you're going to hear what I have to say. Right. Like, I wonder, like, like, you know, it's awkward. You know, Meek always talked about having to hear back to back in the club. You know what I'm saying? 
And as a hip hop fan, you'd be like, yo, that is a dope record. But like back to back still plays after a while. And now Meek and Drake are cool and that record will still play forever. Um, you know, Ether and Takeover are still like amazing records and play forever and Nas and Jay are cool. So that's why I talk about like when it inspires the best music, like, you know, you can kind of live with it. But when it's just cheap shots back and forth, it's like I'm over it. Um, let's talk about just a little controversy. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be um, Drake if there wasn't no controversy. TSU is getting quite a bit of heat, um, you know, because there's a sample, there's a credited R. Kelly half on the baby sample, uh, OG Ron C. It is really a sample of him on the mixtape and half on the baby is playing in the background. 40 released a statement out of this. Do you think that, you know, 40 saying, and I'm just paraphrasing, but it wasn't their intent. They're not supporters of R. Kelly. It was just a sample they had to clear. Um, is this a big controversy? Will this loom over the album? Will it blow over once the news cycle is over? Like, like, what do we make of this R. Kelly sample on TSU? For an album called Certified Lover Boy, it's important if you're gearing towards the ladies to be sensitive to things like that. However, mm. we all or individually may feel about R. Kelly as a person, about the situation. Um, I think it's really important to understand that some people, especially the ladies that love you, might have experienced something similar and not have had a voice in that sense. And I feel like if if they might have had some more time or maybe really felt it out, um, they would be able to like get ahead of that. Um, I don't think it was intentional. I do believe 40 uh, but I do also feel like that they know that they should be more, I feel like, on top of things like that. Hence, that type of a statement. Erin, mm-hmm. any thoughts? Yeah, I think 40 releasing that statement, though, was like a really, really good thing for him to do. Um, as opposed to just letting it loom a little. But, you know, they said they had to clear it to get the OG Ron C's voice on it. And if that's what happens on the business side, then I think... You know, there's there's things that you literally cannot avoid, and that's one of them, right? So, um, again, Letty, like you you said it, you need a risk. We're in a trial. Like, there's a trial happening right now for a heinous crimes, and you can't get away from that. Um, but to Forty's point, clearing the song just for for OG Ronzi's voice, if that's what it is, and that's what it is. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, and, and that's dope perspective. Thank you for that. Um, and and I love on this show to listen just as much as I. I talk, you know? And look, I still don't hear the sample in in, in the background. Like, I, and, and I had to go back. Like, obviously, I saw the credits and I didn't hear the sample. So it wasn't like this important part of the song. And my guess, and it's not even to make excuses for them, but my guess is that maybe they didn't hear it either and felt like, oh, we don't have to clear that. Like, we're clearing the OG Ron C part. And the label maybe was just like, no, there's a R. Kelly sample in here that you must clear, you know. But then the question is, do you get OG Ron C back in the studio and just like, hey, just redo the vocals? Was there enough time? There's still some more questions maybe about that, and, and maybe there just wasn't enough time. But, you know, the one thing I, I, I will say about, you know, in the 40 statement is the intent. Like, I, I would never question, you know, Drake. Drake is definitely toxic mas- masculinity on this album, as he has said. It's not. I never believed it's that toxic. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like. There, there, there's a long way to that. So I never, I never felt like Drake was it used that sample or to make a statement or, or whatever. And it just maybe felt like an oversight or something that they just weren't paying close enough attention to to catch when they should have caught it. Um, yeah, but you know, it'd be interesting how that plays out. I, you know, I guess before we we wrap up. You know, Certified Lover Boy, I, I mean, we're talking about Drake now. He is not a new artist. He is over 10 years in the game. He is, in a lot of ways, the standard, um, the torchbearers. You know, when we talk about this generation, one of the top three and, and where you place him is probably on your preference. But when we talk about that Cole, Drake, Kendrick, you know, really whoever dropped the album last is probably number one, right? Like it's so, I think, interchangeable and close depending on what type of fan you are. But he is up there. So what does what does Certified Lover Boy say about Drake's legacy at this point? 
You know, I think he's really just getting ready for a new chapter. I think, again, going back to that that kind of victory point, like, he did, he, this album feels like other songs, to your point, Rob, like it does. But those were some of the greatest songs, right? Um, so for his legacy, this is just a new chapter in those next 10 years. And I think he made his mark. He can move forward. He can change his style at this point if he really wanted to. He can go independent if he really wanted to. There's a whole new world out there for the next 10 years, and this just set him up. Yeah, I don't think I, I I can't see him doing the independent thing, especially those bars when he was talking about the twenty five and twenty five more and digging your pockets. Like he he gonna get this major label money because it is it's working and he definitely ain't missing no mills. Nah, but I mean he doesn't have to. You'd feel me like he doesn't he doesn't necessarily have to anymore. So there's the option. Yeah, no, for sure. I think this album was put in to be like the epitome of the certified lover boy that is Drake's career up until now. I honestly feel like this dude and I think all of us are ready for him to settle down. And I really feel like this might have been his last hurrah. Uh, and I'm hoping that for him. Um, and he's now able to mature in that sense, right? Because we do want to see growth. And I think he is, he knows like the different facets of single life and playboy life. And I think that expecting like a more elevated Drake would be maybe someone that is more serious or in a, in a more mature relationship. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping. And that is like the next for Drake. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I, I, I agree with you both. Like the, a lot of the, the songs on here felt like interchangeable of like some, like you could have took some stuff off of the last album and put it here. And, and it, I think it was just like revisiting what he does really well. Um, I, for me, I'm like, we get it. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, and I think he's able to exist on so many different levels and, and be at the top of his game. Like, he's funny and he can have fun, like on Poppy's Home and Way Too Sexy. He could be lyrical, like on 7 a.m. Or, or Champagne Poetry. You know, he could give you the hit records. Like, he's proven that he could done it all. It'll be interesting to see where he goes from here. Um, but, I, you know, I, I don't think he has anything else to prove. I, again, me as a fan, I would love that rap album that... You know, they want a classic that's just 10 of these. I don't know if I'll ever get that. And I'm I'm okay with that, too. I've also reconciled with that. So, um, you know, I, I don't think there's nothing else for him to prove, but I would love to see him kind of push the envelope or just where he would take it from here. One last question. One, one, one thing, and I'm sorry. I know I said the last one was the last one. Yo, one thing that I noticed, and I haven't seen anybody talk about, but one thing that I noticed was missing from this album, and it felt like something was missing for me, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and I looked at the production credits, No Boy Wonder. First Drake album with No Boy Wonder production. Um, and I miss it. Boy would have definitely given us the dance, the dance, I feel, like the dance record, the record that we're like vibing to for real, for real, like besides the Too Sexy. Right. And maybe with a Rihanna feature. <laughs> I feel like that that's what was missing for me. <laughs> that's that's the Thames record. That's, yeah. you know, he went Afro beats mm -hmm. this time, which is yeah. blessed. I was totally sure that Wanda was on something. If I messed up my bad, I looked three times. I didn't see Wanda's name, not once. I, vinyls was on it. I, I love vinyls and Drake collaboration. Also, a lot of the production collaborations were like in multitudes. Like it was a lot of producers getting together to make one track on this more so than usual. But I didn't see Wanda's name not once. And, and aside from the dance track that Letty was kind of speaking of, like I, I looked to Wanda for that hard shit. Like, like it's just like that hip hop timeless this record will be rocking for the next 20 years type shit. And um, it, I, I, it left a question mark not to see Wonder on this track list. So, um, and I know they just came off of Lemon Pepper Freestyle, uh, which again, for me as a rap fan, is one of those ones. This is this is crazy that Wonder really isn't on it. I will say one thing about Wonder though, is that he has mentored so many incredible producers, right? And at this point, he he doesn't necessarily have to be in the room because the sound is already there. Um, but you bringing that up, like, that's wild to me. Yeah, nah, it, it's crazy. But um, I appreciate y'all. I appreciate, listen, this was Certified Lover Boy. So it was very important, I think, to have the ladies' perspective because because I think for, for a lot of it, he might have been speaking for us or certain versions of us. But a lot of it, and a lot of Drake's music is speaking to the ladies. Um I enjoyed talking about this album with y'all and getting y'all perspective. Like, I learned things just listening to y'all. 
Aaron, thank you. Letty, thank you. And thank you all for watching. For the record, you know how we do in the comments. Let us know what you think. What's your favorite track on, on Drake? What were you expecting? Did he meet your expectations? Yeah, I know I get in the comments and I talk about it all with y'all. So until the next for the record, peace.